soldier, come lay down your gun. Come and meet your God with a smile. Soldier, soldier, don't look back, my son. Be seated with me for a while. Soldier, soldier, come and lay down your arms. There's no judgments to pass. Soldier, soldier, need God on your terms. The sins of your heart is to pass. Soldier, soldier, come and lay down your gun. Come and meet your God with a smile. Soldier, soldier, don't look back, my son. Be seated with me for a while. Sometimes call ourselves Hubba Book. There's a poem to explain that in the second half. Um, we are pro soldier, anti war. Some of us have got a military history. Some of us just look as if we have. <laughs> uh, we also noted that we were in competition with Brian May from Queen. Um, <coughs> exalted company. And he was also on the, uh, remember, it's festival last night as well. So we've got a good shot of what we completed and who's here tonight. There's a welcome contribution from Brian now. The red poppy. The red paper poppy can mean to me the lightness of life and the weight of death, the pain of love, the soldier's last breath, a flower that grows where someone fell, the journey made from heaven to hell. The sweetness dreamed of a summer's field. That peace can mean war and wars can lie. That someone somewhere was covered in blood and Helmand's purple is a moneyed drug. The red paper poppy's monetary gift is to help the legion of volunteers provide care and not cast adrift like others, those in the valley of tears. My red paper poppy is my family. Mum, Dad, Grandpa Sherman, Grandpa Wilkie. In love for them. And my son. I wear my poppy red and ask for no more war. No more dead. I'll explain something about these, um, these photographs and what we're doing tonight. Um, we're not charging an enormous fee. This is purely for charity. That's not meant to be a rounding couplet, but it's purely for charity and help for heroes. And I've got both straps on me here. I've got help for heroes and I've got uh, the poppy, the British Legion. And normally I would raise money for uh, the British Legion. In fact, I stood outside of Asda in Shipley with this just to scare the punters into coughing up a bit of money. But this charity is my son's charity. He visits uh, comrades at Headley Court who he's uh, been with in Afghanistan. And he's seen some, as you can imagine, horrible situations. Um, so in that sense, and that sense only, i.e. Re rehabilitation, Help for Heroes is the immediate call for money tonight. That's not to decry the incredible work that the British Legion do all year round. And not just looking after uh, former members of the armed forces like myself, but also uh, families of those people as well. It's an incredible amount of work that they do. But I've had a thousand requests. 
uh, to tell people about the podcast. And when we finish at the end, when the lights come on, uh, you better get a, a close look. But there is a reason we're in the shade. It's because they're not here anymore. And the reason this is in colour and in light is because he is, but well, he was this morning anyway. This lady here, Noor Iniat Khan, um, was actually a Muslim princess from a fairly middle class family. Her father was a composer. And uh, the beauty of old people, I was going to say Nick, but adapted uh, some, of his, some of his work. And he actually, uh, her father actually composed two operas. And in 1940, she sort of, she partly grew up in London, and then, I think it was about the age of 13 when her father died, she went to live in, in Paris. So she's fluent in both English and French, and see where she's going. And uh, in 1940, her brother joined the Air Force, came across to, to England to join the Air Force. <clears throat> Being a bit bored, she went with him, because she's a bit like that. And she um, went to Harrogate, came to Harrogate, and trained as a wireless operator. So she acquired Morse code and those sorts of transmission skills, learned about Ohm's law and the stratosphere and all this stuff. And she was posted to Bomber Command and she was bored, so she asked to be commissioned. And they decided because of her fluency in English and French and her ability at transmitting that she could go into SOE, Special Operations Executive. You know, so you know where this one's going, don't you? SOE. And um, I think it was in that, I'm just going to check. You know, it was 1943, June 43, she found herself coming out of a Lysander in a moment meadow in France, and for a year and a half was on the run, uh, transmitting. Um, it's thought she was longest lasting SOE uh, operative. Um, but she did take things uh, literally, her brother was a bit concerned about, oh, there is a bit I just missed out, I should tell you this. Um, she actually wrote a book on children's tales, and while she's in Bomber Command, it's broadcast on the BBC's Children's Hour. So an incredibly tiny person, the last sort of person you'd think would be parachuting into France to do this work. But she survived for a year and a half. But I'm going to read you the operational command and there's a reason for this. Uh, this is what it actually said. Uh, operational orders say, be careful, extremely careful with the firing of your messages. Now in that curious old fashioned English, way of English, it meant sending the messages. But she filed them. She wrote them all down in a notebook. The ones she sent, the ones she received. <clears throat> when they broke into her room, she had everything in a notebook, which was beside the bed. And uh, <coughs> she ended up in Dakar and was shot in the back of the head. Uh, and as she was shot, she shouted Liberty. And what we don't know is whether it was Liberty or Liberté, English or French, but she shouted Liberty. So an incredible woman, no in that car. Um, the local connection, fairly local. Um, Harrogate, I know you're not local if you're from Stainford, but Harrogate will do for me. <laughs> Edith Sheeran, my mum, in the ATS, was on the artillery down at Portlandville, an abiding memory of a Spitfire part was playing on fire, coming near to the guns as a crash. Um, not with us anymore, but here tonight. My father, poster boy for the Air Force, took after me. No, sorry. And in the Desert Air Force, there is a, I know some of you are expecting to say, so you've heard this, you know what's coming next. There is a claim to fame in that whilst he was in North Africa, he was, a, he was in a, a maintenance unit attached to the 8th Army. And as part of that process, he had to go behind the lines and retrieve crashed aircraft. And there's a story about the resume operation, uh, the commanding officer going, got a decoration, the fight sergeant got a decoration, and I think there were five, including my old man, uh, had to draw lots to see who got it. So he never got decorated. Um, but that's what he's famous for. On um, one night in Alexandria, they backed up a three-ton truck to this street after the uh, Axis forces had left, and stole a piano from this house. <coughs> and this particular piano was a baby grand. And my dad told me this story, I never thought anything of it. Got it down the steps, into the back of this Bedford truck, Block got it in the back, put the tailgate up, Block in the back, playing the piano, my dad's in the front, somebody's driving down the street, stopped by the service place, where are you going with this? What are you doing? So they're arrested, 
um, and charged with a theft of this piano. Found guilty, confined to barracks for three weeks. The piano belonged to the German high command. It had been shipped across from Germany. It was 200 years old. The Times did a report on this about 10 years ago. So it was worth £400,000. It was bought by an Israeli piano tuner in 1948. And it was an 18th century masterpiece. It was Rommel's piano. So that's, that's his claim to fame. <laughs> and I, I, I say that to stop somebody else trying to write a song about it, because I promised I would write a story. And the Italian bloc did write a story, he made a fortune out of it in the 1960s, and somebody, so somebody said he'd made it all up. The Times got it wrong as well. They said it was three soldiers in the 8th Army. It wasn't. It was three ragamuffins in the Air Force attached to the 8th Army, and he was one of them. My grandfather, it's another story. Now, this is Henry, I have to say this, this is my adopted grandfather, and this is likely to be my biological grandfather. I can say that, no, my nana's not here, because she saved the photograph. But everybody says that's him, but that is actually my adopted grandfather. I mean, the thing about Grandpa Sherman, he's got three inverted chevrons here, because he was gassed and blinded twice. Uh, and gassed a third time. And he was at all the big battles. Eat, Passchendaele, Mont, the Somme. He was at all of those. And he was also riddled with shrapnel, as I saw in later years uh, when he was dying. So that's Grandpa Sherman, Harry Sherman. From, oh, I should have said, from Bow. These are cottonies. I mean, literally from Bow. Nowhere else, not pretending. And my mum was born in Bow as well. Grandpa Wilkie, John Armitage Wilkinson, Sergeant Indian Army. The first Johnny Wilkinson to play rugby for England. Uh, and uh, this character, well, it's my dad. But it's Egypt, and they all did it. Lawrence of Arabia was the hero. For that generation born around about 1920 and, and so on. And actually, my old man didn't speak a bit of Arabic. Um, the stuff I know I can't repeat, but he, he did. So we sort of got used to that sort of phraseology. Right. John. I can see. Okay. Sorry. Going too long. <laughs> Shed my tears. 
tears My last tears Deadly silence A deadly silence We know about Christmas 1914, we know about the famous football match, well actually there was more than one football match, but there was only one that had a recorded score of 3-2 to Germany. Uh, we know about exchanging uh, uh, cigarettes and so on, and singing cows, particularly Silent Night. What's maybe forgotten in all of this is, is, is the poetry that was written, and there's clearly two sides and I'm talking pro-war or anti-war. I'm not talking by nationality here. And Rupert Brooke, uh, the glamour boy, and I say that without any sort of dig at him, was in their own heavy volunteer reserve. <clears throat> and he wrote a poem called The Soldier. And Brooke was part of the cap caught up with the, the nationalistic fervour, if you like. So this is an extract from The Soldier. If I should die, think only this of me, that there's some corner of a foreign field that is forever England. There shall be in that rich earth a richer dust concealed, a dust whom England bore, shaped, made aware, gave once her flowers to love, her ways to roam, a body of England's breathing English air, Washed by the rivers, blessed by sons of home. The bitter reality, of course, was mud, blood and slaughter. In September, 26 September 1915, there was, the, I suppose we say, the infamous battle of, of Luce. And if my German is wrong, I know somebody will correct me. Luce was called the, the Leichenfeld von Luce. The killing fields of Luz. Um And the 12 British battalions there attacking German positions, it was two and a half hours of actual battle, and nobody's making any advance in the mud. And I think it's at that point that, and I think this is Ludendorff, one of the German generals said to another general that the British are lions led by donkeys. I'm tempted to say, from my days in the Air Force, then and now. When I was in the Air Force, the Secretary of State uh, for the Armed Forces was Lord Lampton. We now know what he was getting up to. Because it was a Sunday, I didn't tell you. Kipling, Rudyard Kipling, uh, you know the story here, you know I'm going to listen. John Kipling, his son was only 18 and very short sighted. And Kipling Sr. pulled strings with the War Department to get his son into the, uh, the Irish Guards. And of course, uh, he was killed at Luce. And Kipling Sr. wrote this. If any question why we died, tell them. Because our fathers lied. That's maybe something you don't want to hear about Kipling. The bitterness of, and blaming of himself. 400 yards away, 
<clears throat> it was the uh, 70th London Popper and Stepney Rifles, and it was my grandfather. Well, 400 yards would be like a mile in that mud. And Grandpa Shane was there for two months uh, at the song, September, October 1916. He was actually a beautiful stretcher bearer. He was only five foot two. And what was noticeable on a program the other night about um, Wilfred Owen, that Jeremy Paxman, that was a repeat program, as it usually was, Jeremy, Pax, sorry, Jeremy Paxman said that uh, Wilfred Owen was lucky to get in because he was only five, five and a half. Um, if you were of an ordinary rank, it didn't matter what height you were, you were fodder. In my view. And uh, his job, not to take was to go on his belly through the mud and bring back bits of bodies or anybody who's injured. That was his job, to actually go out into no man's land when there was no uh, ordnance being fired and bring them back. Lawrence Binion, I was going to say a local lad, but Britain in Lonsdale doesn't really count. Uh, he was born in Lancaster. Um, 1869, it says that down here, 1869. And uh, a couple of us here have actually been to the, the vicarage where he, he lived there from up to the age of five. It's a big vicarage, it's 11 bedrooms, quite impressive. Uh, and he grew up as a, uh, a Quaker, as, uh, as a pacifist. But uh, part of For the Fall, which is a famous poem, and you'll hear that when we do the Act of Remembrance. But, Part of it he talked in terms of the glory that shines upon our tears. I find that a strange position for a Quaker to take in terms of war. I can only assume that Binion, like others, were caught up in that fervour. And I do know he attended a conference uh, in September uh, 1914 to <coughs> write material to lift the national spirit from the morale. This is a short extract from the Arras Road. But here the night is holy, and here I will remember, and draw near, and for a space till night be sped, be with the beauty of the dead. Siegfried Sassoon, I used to use a hairdresser, so I'm terrible, terrible. I think when I was younger, the rest. Right. <laughs> Siegfried Sassoon, MC, Military Cross. We know he became anti war and ended up at Craig Lockhart. Well, there was anything wrong with him, it was just to get him out of the way after he wrote to the Times. He wrote about Arras and the Arras Road. This is it, the general. Good morning, good morning, the general said when we met him last week on our way to the line. Now, the soldiers he smiled at are most of them dead. And we're cursing his staff for incompetent swine. Material card. Grunted Harry to Jack as he slogged up to Arras with rifle and pack. But he did for them both by his plan of attack. <clears throat> Jesse Pope. Sorry. Writing for the Daily Mail. There's an involuntary grunt. I'm just going to say the name Jesse Pope. I'll read this. This is the sort of stuff that the press were putting out to whip up the fervour. <clears throat> it's called Who's for the Game? Who's for the game? The biggest that's played, the red crashing game of a fight. Who'll grip and tackle the job unafraid? And who thinks he'd rather sit tight? Who told the line for the signal to go? Who'll give his country a hand? Who wants to turn to himself in the show? And who wants to see it in the stand? Who knows it won't be a picnic? Not much. Yet eagerly shoulders a gun. Who would much rather come back with a crutch than lie low and be out of the fun? Come along, lads. It'll come on all right. There's only one course to pursue. Your country is up to her neck in a fight, and she's looking and calling for you. Wilfred Owen replied, Wilfred Owen, Military Cross, Dulce et decorum est, how sweet and decorous it is. The friend he refers to is Jesse Pope. Bent double, 
Like old beggars under sacks, knock kneed coughing like hags, we cursed through sludge. So on the haunting flares we turned our backs and towards our distant rest began to trudge. Men marched asleep. Many had lost their boots, but limped on, blood shod. All went lame, all blind, drunk with fatigue. Death even to the hoots of tired, outstripped five nines that dropped behind. Gas, gas, quick boys, an ecstasy of fumbling, fitting the clumsy helmets just in time. But someone still was yelling out and stumbling and floundering like a man in fire or lime. Dim through the misty panes and thick green light, as under a green sea I saw him drowning in all my dreams. Before my helpless sight, he plunges at me, guttering, choking, drowning. If in some smuggling dreams you too could pace behind the wagon that we fun him in and watch the white eyes writhing in his face, his hanging face, like a devil sick of sin. If you could hear at every jolt the blood come gargling from the froth corrupted lungs, obscene as cancer, bitter as the cud of vile, incurable sores on innocent tongues. My friend, you would not tell with such high zest to children ardent for some desperate glory, the old lie, dulce et decorum est, pro patria more. Uh, in the. Uh, <laughs> In the, the, the battlefields of the Somme, the silent cities as they call them, where the, the, the thousands who endured the unendurable are buried, uh, there's a very profitable trade in, in looting for buttons, for battle between military <coughs> and the ability to set up on eBay, that kind of thing. Um, and I remember they were interviewing on one of these programs, one of the, the widows, who said, well, it's like killing a man twice because we can never excavate the graves, we can't find out who they were from private information, but the power, you know, the name, anything that identified that soldier, that could reunite that soldier, that could give them a grave had been renewed, moved. And all these, these, what I call them grave robbers, would leave is just bones. Uh, so this song is called All That I Am. <laughs> This is a 
true story. Flanders, Flanders, Harry, known as Titch, became a giant as he swam through Flanders on Tommy's track. He was a vow to Tommy's consonant in their shared word puzzles used to distract. As Harry slithered, no complete words came. A bugler stretcher bearer with big hearts, retrieving what would be another name for some poor bugger's body part. Caked in mud, Harry pulled above his weight, some more complete than blown up others, often from the same street and sometimes Brothers from Bow, Poplar, Stepney, in common fate. Then Harry touched the still head of Tommy and bit by bit brought back the body to quickly bury. And he, the bugler, played at first light for Private Thomas Granville, Rifle Brigade. Now up to now, you're probably feeling a little bit harrowed with some of this detail. This is another story. It's a half truth. <coughs> but you hear snippets and you work on them and it becomes your own truth. <coughs> and it's um, based around Armistice Day 1918. In all villages, there's an idiot who alone always dares to tell the truth and sadly there's always the opposite a liar who tells hateful tales without proof and so it was that another rumour spread started by the liar that so and so was dead his wife became a wartime widow for the day till he the husband returned who had not gone away when questioned in public, the liar said, No one here will come to anything good. And the idiot shouted, It's all in your head! It was said the liar be barred from the pub. The village thought the liar should feel the pain that the war widow received for a day. To be barred from the pub was no one's game. If he showed his face, he'd have to pay for drinks for everyone, including grub. And if he didn't, he'd be barred from the pub. Greg got back, but the liar's purse was sealed until the day he found some gold in a field. I'm as honest as the field in which I stood, he thought, as he went to pay his reparation. But there'd been a theft. That increased the tension, and the landlord said, You're bad from the pub. <laughs> Some shoes for them, don't you? Hmm? Oh, shoes, yeah. Sorry, it's all right. Get carried away. <laughs> I uh, had the pleasure of meeting an old uh, Jew. He was the only English Jew ever to be imprisoned in Auschwitz. And he was the author of a book, An Englishman in Auschwitz. And he survived, his entire family didn't. And uh, he said, visit the death camp, write to me on your return, let me know what you think. Well, of course, me and my partner finally did. What knows you write to somebody? What, what can you possibly say? There's nothing. I, I composed the following song for him, but unfortunately he died just before he ever heard it. But it's called... Holocaust denial. into the eye of those deprived of their lives. Rope on rope on rope on rope on 
long road of monochrome despite the stare to remind me of the genocide and the lies and I saw the wild Twisted, so twisted with its pulse to expire. There to remind me of the Holocaust denier. they fall there to remind me what we all fought for and I stood in the gas chamber and in there I remember It's where they beg for their lives From the gas of the shower There to remind me Never again crematorium where they burnt the bodies alive where six million died there to remind me of a holocaust denied We've got a place in Bulgaria, and if you uh, didn't know much about Bulgaria, during the Second World War they were partly Axis, and suddenly, halfway through, they changed their mind. Uh, Why thinking, I believe. Um, but there were, as Steve mentioned earlier, the Special Operations Executive, there was a gentleman by the name of Frank Thompson who was hired by Churchill to organise partisan resistance across Bulgaria. And um, ten of them, unfortunately, not Frank, he was, he was actually shot in the field, but... Uh, in the village of Khrushchevo, where the partisans were hiding, um, ten villagers were rounded up and they were taken into the woods and they were executed for being partisans by the, uh, the um, local police. And um, after the war, because they were heralded as heroes by the Soviets, they built a big monument on the top of the hill and they dug the graves up, they put the bodies, one, one was just 15 years of age, and they buried them in this massive um, monument on the top of the hill to the partisans, local heroes. But comes democracy in 1989 and the collapse of the Soviet Union, uh, the, the ideology changes, the thinking changes, and I've never got my head around it. Suddenly the partisans became terrorists because they'd actually been attacking Bulgarian forces. Um, there you go. The monument was to be destroyed and uh, it was scheduled for demolition. Uh, but they turned up to blow it up apparently, and this is how the story goes. They'd find out, well, they found out that Vodafone had put a telephone mast on the top of the monument and they, uh, God bless capitalism, they couldn't blow it up because of the telephone man. <laughs> and uh, the monument is, is still there to this day. Um, from where I sit, you know, if they were on our side, they were okay. Um, so I, I never, I've never understood that thinking. But there you go. Uh, members of the Special Operations Executive. This song is called Partisan. <laughs> Every the past on the future. Hey, 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 h
the hills that are not so far away. Living in the foothills, raking in the hay. Here's the untold story. Two, if you like, memorials um, to two men. One who was not here, uh, Jerry Lightfoot, who, who was a neighbour, Trish and myself, and Trish especially. Um, and my dad, so I do with Jerry first. We always get all three middle names, don't we? Like, I'm Stephen Armitage Wilkins. Where did Armitage come from? It's my great, it's my great grandmother's maiden name. You don't pass right down the elder, someone always cop for it. Um, well, Jerry, or Jeremiah, he caught for Bainbridge as his middle name. Jeremiah Bainbridge Lightfoot. Uh, and Jerry died just over three, three years ago. And he was in the Ox and Bucks in the war. Now, Jerry was a Geordie. His accent was that strong. He'd been down in Shipley, did I say that word? Been in Shipley uh, for decades, since about I think, 1937, 38. About right there. Something like that. And he still had a strong accent. And when he landed in Shipley, his wife May got the locals to come and listen to him. <laughs> They're all crowded in the house to listen to this accent. I didn't imagine that. Anyway, of course, Ox and Bucks, like my old man, was behind the guns at Elm Lane. Uh, Jerry was at the front. He was going through the Ox and Bucks. They were the first through. So they at Elm Lane and they crossed to Italy. And he, he, he did tell me a tale about, he, he was MT, you know, his motor transport. And it's the old proverbial high road, low road. And his mate went on the low road and got ambushed, and he went on the high road and ended up in Milan. <coughs> and he was actually <coughs> me, in the main square in, in, in Milan when Mussolini and Crowd of Patachi were brought in and hung upside down. And Jerry said it was actually 
a British officer who, um, who tied a, a rope around Trevor Pitachi's skirt to stop it from falling out for the sake of decency. Um, but you won't read that one in the history books. He also liked his orange and brandy. And once walked across from Trisha's house to his house with him, and, and he suddenly keeled over. <laughs> and he said, it's me, it's me. He said, it's not your name, you're something worse for the word. Uh, and when he, at his funeral, that is buried on the coffin, and this incredible row. I mean, my old man had six for campaign stuff, and God knows how many had just a row of these things there. It really seems some, some action, very short. And this was um, passed to his sister, <laughs> Jerry, Jeremiah. In his mid 80s, isn't home tonight. His curtains aren't closed. Nothing of that long Yorkshire Geordie voice. I'm told he's gone to the one he once proposed. The next one <coughs> about my dad. Now, having a surname like Wilkinson, it gets shot to Wilkie or Wilco. And in the Second World War in North Africa, there was an American Republican politician called Wendell Wilkie who was campaigning even then during the war for presidential votes. And he visited the troops out there. And there are some stories that you can tell what happened, so stuff that gets covered up when the Americans came back, worse for wear and firing off guns. The bloke in the next tent to me, old man was sitting up being sick, bullets straight through, covered up. Uh, so my old man, instead of being called Paul or Wilkie, got called Wendell. And that stuck for the next 75 years, sorry, next 70 years, 70 can't be. Next 60 years, my apologies, next 60 years. So we always called him Wendell. If you'll think mum and dad, no, it was mum and Wendell. Bit of this. <laughs> so this is a little bit about what he left me. And I just to keep in mind what we used to have in the outhouse, uh, which was a last to repair shoes on with rubber stick on soles from Woolies and put them on the last and repair the shoe. <laughs> so we used to bear that in mind. Wendell's treasurer, a medal inscribed pro regi et legi between the hours presented to the captain of Cross Flats, school for short vowels, from athletics to Africa, and this little cardboard skip, 651-569, corporal, according to the slip, with an X tacked across the slot for the Africa star, and a class and had been stuffed in a canopic jar. A red, white and green ribbon star, the Italian campaign. Repairing geodetic airframes doesn't quite sound the same. Grandpa Wilkie's two motor medals leads to London and back. Andrew, rugby player, got Grandpa's gold tassel rugby cap. Tins of rusty nuts and bolts with G clamps and brake fluid jars, navy blue overalls, grease gun from working on knackered cars. The Hunslet Moor boundary post that failed to move a motorway, pig iron that my dad would leapfrog in his more youthful day. A memory of the final day of Wendell's working life. Passing mum his pay, saying, Sort of cobbler through his life. <laughs> we went into Iraq now. He was there on the first wave. There's another story at the end of that one. It's March 21st, 2003, with three short ones. The Friday evening news. Baghdad's domed darkness repeatedly flared as George Bush's war on terrors declared. Incubated abdomens undulate in time with sirens sounding their fate. A dissuasive percussion fills the air as pacifists capture a Bradford Square. This one's for Steve Roberts, who lived in Shipley, he was a Cornishman but lived in Shipley. Sergeant Steve Roberts, the first. British troop, uh, first British soldier uh, to be killed in war. He was a tank commander. Actually, I'm going to put in a plug here for uh, war widows' pensions. Um, Sam Roberts, 
I was in the Telegraph and Argus last night, so that must be true. Um, as she gets me like £90 a month as a war widow's pension, and she's refused to accept it now. Because we all know what's going to happen to pensions. Instead of being indexed linked to the retail price index, which is around 5%, it's going to be the CPI consumer price index, which is a lot lower. So it doesn't include mortgage increases. And the two other restrictions to a war, as a war widow receiving pension, if you uh, cohabit, this is the main restriction, if you cohabit, then you, you, your pension is stopped. So it's a plug. So they don't get its act together on war widows. It's bad enough being a war widow without the rubbish on your pension. And Steve Roberts was a tank commander. He was shot in the chest, you may remember this, during friendly fire. And he'd been ordered to give his body armour uh, to another soldier because of a shortage. And a later inquest stated he would have been alive if it had been delivered the Kevlar plates to protect his uh, body armour. And Jeff Hoon, member of him, Secretary of State for Defence, he slowed down the supplies of Kevlar plates to hide the preparation for war. So they're out there without protection. <clears throat> 24th of March 2003, consequence. To hide the push of preparing for war, buffoon slowed the rush of shields to the core. At Azubair, tank troops dropped to their feet. The first Brit killed lived in a nearby street in Shipley. Fighting can be dangerous, but lack of armour is taking the piss. We had a long debate about swearing. We had a real long debate. What's half new repertoire? <laughs> about, about whether I should uh, use that last word. Really. But it, it's, it's in there. The next one, uh, it's that Chris Finney, who was, was a he's a trooper, he was age 19 at the time. This is, uh, we're talking seven years ago. And he got the George Cross, did uh, Chris Finney. And this is the definition of the George Cross it's conspicuous gallantry, not in the face of the enemy. He, his George Cross would have been a VC, Victoria. So he would have been the first Victoria Cross if it hadn't been friendly fire. And his best mate, that's Corporal Matty Hall, was actually killed. All the way from Idaho. An American A-10 broke away from the Walt Hog Pack and above the day came back, shadowing the lay of the ground, coming closer. Find round after round at the Union Jack. One trooper dead. Another is bum hold now placed in bed. He'd climbed back onto his burning tank to save the torn life of a brother rank. Then shot. He grabbed and again half climbed to save to find the other life condemned. Uh, this song is dedicated to the memory of the victims of the Twin Towers.
I love her if only And I try But you would not pick up the phone Yeah, I try Cause you're already gone from home And I try To bring both mom and dad Cause every friend that we knew and had Believe me, I try And this darkness The darkness came with the airplane The jump is strong to avoid the pain And I'm crawling But the walls of flame I wish that I could see you again Love listen I rang to say that I love you so And I hope I hope my message lets you know And this time To let your lovers go, to go, to go Beg that it would not be so My lover, if only This poem was written on the, uh, or based on, should I say, the 4th of April 2003, day 16 of the, the campaign, uh, if you like, the invasion of Iraq. And I was coming back from work in, in Bradford. Uh, I don't know why somebody's road and turn, I won't give too much of the directions. It's a fairly notorious area, but going from somebody's road, Chain Street, and across to the on the back streets to beat the traffic. And I saw some lads uh, handing out. A leaflet, so I stopped, pulled up, came back, and outside the mosque. And I found one, somebody had obviously got it um, from the mosque, coming out of the mosque, and shoot it down this drill. So I thought, I know what that is, grabbed it, and sure enough, there's a leaflet from a, a group called His, His Book Tahrir. And His Book Tahrir are the equivalent of the British National Party. Um, um, and racist, when they use racist words, they put them in Arabic. So, for example, there's Jehud and Yahud. That's a place I'm, I don't think, anyway, got a, got a grip of that idea. Um, so this poem combines two things. It combines what actually happened on that day in Iraq and also what happened in Bradford and also what the leaflet said in it, one. Jihad. Bags of fevered money are found to bribe drivers into martyrdom, to connive a collapse by means of suicide, 
A screaming woman runs to survive from her sister's car. Her unborn bursts as the other plunges death and blood, dirt. Muslims mingling outside a Bradford mosque, leaving post prayer given at no cost, a leaflet declaring Bush's war hate, a crusade. Muslims must eliminate Muslim leaders who quietly help Bush. It's obligatory, which means we must. Bush allowed the Jew to murder Muslim. Bush and Blair, the enemies of Islam. This next one, one of the many uh, mistakes made in Iraq. We call it blue on blue, don't we? Perhaps you don't know, because the other expression doesn't sound too good, friendly fire. So this is about day 18, eagle jet roulette. A bomb painted red and white amputates BBC legs, one of many mistakes. Now he's dead. A translator in convoy with Americans and Kurdish envoy. Now a company of bits. Blood splattered camera lenses on corpses and battered special forces who called an eagle jet to bomb a distant tank. Not played roulette. This next one, I haven't got the regiment, sorry. This next one um, was based on an incident in, in Basra, uh, in, in southern Iraq. And it happened at the, uh, the College of Literature. You can imagine the gates full of uh, Arabic, that calligraphic script that you would have on the gates. <coughs> Some say they shoot, drop weapons, wave white flags, and move on. Last time in the College of Armature, winding us up. But now it's literature. We'll quote the book that bookish types recite. The book of army facts. It's dark, it's night. Two bagpipers calm their nerves rehearsing at first light before quickly departing for the attack. A Challenger tank crashed through the College Gate's calligraphic mask, which fell away to reveal RPG. Failing death, a Fedayeen refugee took aim from 20 metres but was stopped. Two others sprang from the dead and shot automatic fire through four Irish guards. Hit through head and neck, both pipers' limbs jarred. Mates from Zimbabwe, the other Dublin. The first black piper and the discipline of an OU degree for the other in English lit. Same blood colour. The regimental motto is valorous. Quis separabit, whole separate. Was. And that is for Bats Corpus, Ian Malone, and Chris Masbura. The final one for me, for John's next one, is not one to go. This is for David Kelly, Dr. David Kelly. So much a swirl of argument around the death of David Kelly. And this is, this is, this is very short. You know, this is the thing about Alistair Campbell. And whether or not um, Dr. David Kelly has said to uh, Andrew Gilligan, the BBC reporter, had you implied to the press, bear in mind you met with the press in a hotel without permission from your employer. Now, with my other background, that's sackable. So it was already out on the living meeting with the journalist. And of course, the Foreign Affairs Committee wanted to know when they interviewed David Kelly, had you implied that Alistair Campbell had set up the document? Of course, Alice Campbell didn't do that. It's called <laughs> Near the Trees. Where they found David Kelly. In the shadow of those to be dismissed, the odour of the order of sophist lingers, like the mist in this Oxford field. There they are, right. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> complete blindness. its fingers stained purple. It must be safer than a postal vote. Democracy is not yet indelible. It's marked market eggs like leaving a note. It was a superb plan from off the peg. Pinstriped man, pinhole, both ends of an egg and blew out the hole yellow and white. But that membrane protects the egg. For mortals, it's the brain, that primordial yoke in which we dip our soldiers, then throw salt into the wound. Detecting. This one's experience. How was it? The anchor at Gargrave. When the fields were being churned up, we see him there with the mine detect you know, looking for gold and all the rest of it. Detecting. The best time is to be first after the plough. That deep, dark mud that has richly preserved, you hope, more than the end of a cow. Like an ancient Saxon find that's lain undisturbed. Hidden gold, the essence of treasury. In my post-war days, it was flying jacket and a Luger from Lower Saxony with war surplus in the exchange and marked. The Valon man still sweeps from side to side, listening to the resonance of an IED. He's steady but very tired and he's lied. He's not looking for old coins in the sand like presents to take home. He moves forward hearing his own sweat drip in his head foam. He stops where he's heard a double tone squeak. He doesn't know that his pulse has peaked. The Staffordshire gold is more than pots and pans. 
It's the names chiselled in the Arboretum. The thousands of names that visitors scan looking for one. We can't wait to see them. A bit more complex this one. Convoy going to war. Ahead. Red lights in persistent convoy. White lights in dead beatified bursts flow back. Darkness gaps the glide's silent envoy. The white lights behind can't yet comprehend this winter madness by which lives must end. The hoar frost glistens with its subterfuge, whilst the vapour trail is roughly streaked with rouge. The skeletal to which flesh falls with time is the wish of men to become fewer. Only now, at this barbaric hour, would a fool call a countenance divine. I, uh, I, I wrote this song, um, probably not so controversial these days, but it certainly was, uh, long before I was a twinkling in mother's eye, I think, for the shot at dawn Parkinson's campaign, the 306 British soldiers shot at dawn uh, with the Commonwealth soldiers, that was 346 shot at dawn without any legal representation, trial, whatever. Um, I mean, in contrast, Germany shot 25, but it's hard to do contrast, they still shot people at dawn. Uh, the USA didn't, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. so perhaps once the USA was right on something. But, uh, this song is written about somebody facing while being shot at dawn, it's called Mother.
dying They're gonna shoot me at dawn Break normally is about 20 minutes. 20 minutes? Yeah. So, back at 10 past nine. Thank you. Thank you. It gets nicer in the May I shake something? Yes. Oh. It's really delightful. I hate whistling. Yeah. When I hear adverts with whistling, I turn the set off. You have reconciled me with the very activity of whistling. <laughs> He made me take the swearing out, though. <laughs> you, don't, you, you don't know the I don't Thank you very much. Thank I was waiting for it, then it suddenly disappeared. <laughs> Thank you, Sir Dominic. And now for the um, dreaded second half. A bit lighter, a lot lighter. <laughs> the first one, that poem that I'm going to read, is going to take us uh, back to if you like, Bradford. Uh, first World War, but the, the figures in terms of dealing with war, and 1948 prices, which was a very good year. <laughs> One comment I should make, Wilfred Owen, um, after he was uh, recovered, after he recovered from the stress, the trauma, uh, shell shock, uh, up in Craig Lockhart up in Scotland, stayed for a period at uh, Burniston Barracks in Scarborough, which I remember very well as, as a kid. And he was sitting on the beach, at the front there and writing letters to, to his mother. So I just want you to remember that bit because what he actually said on the 10th of August 1918 was, uh, this is where he wrote to his mother off, quote, the stinking Leeds and Bradford war profiteers. That's what Wilfred Owen said. It's about the wool exchange. High exposed timbers bathed in light like a Saxon find. Twelve Hammer beams, each with a winged figure, a local shield. Monster, Ripon, Bradford, Halifax and Huddersfield, and Dow and the Goon. Bales of wool priced in the recess of a mind. The woollen firms, who profited from pals down the line, cited by the shell shot poet on Scarborough Sands, later moved accounts to pay for war from the Argentine. Today, display the uniforms of big brass bands. War, greasy, scoured, or combed by a mechanical porcupine, woven by those whose fathers wore Bradford shoddy on the Western Front, only to later see cheaply laboured imports dumb. Cloth-capped men, stuck with tufts of wool, speaking in thirsty tongues, scraping furled wool from scouring plant, breathing through lanolin cloyed lungs. Bradford's bowler-hatted men, dealing upon the wool exchange floor. What have you got? Argentine crossbreds, 56s, good length, cost you 41. Still on the hoof, it'll have strength. I said 48 was a very good year. 62 years ago, I was born at 28 weeks. 28 weeks. Um, my mum had been told that I wouldn't live, and she'd best gone back for the, uh, the body. Uh, she'd lost three babies before me two boys and a girl before me. And when she was dying um, in Shipley Hospital, she could still hear, and I said, it's Stephen here, Mum. And she said, which one was three of you? <laughs> I, I, so I had a lack of imagination, I was desperate to have a sting, and I didn't know that. But when I was younger, I knew about these three babies who hadn't lived, and I wondered where, they, uh, where they'd gone. Blood moon. 
to angels. If ache means absence of sin, moving slowly beneath the red moon, gently etched, feminine and masculine, like two, but in eternity as one. These angels appear in time of need, like the aching breast with which mothers feed. So she looked down upon my useless limbs and bathed my premature and jaundiced skin. He held back, almost unbelieving at this fourth attempt, but now surviving and given the name of the first, Stephen. Two boys and a girl had left for the moon. Once a year, meet with my sister. I don't mean I only see her once a year. She's a pain, I see her too often. But anyway, once a year, <laughs> those who know her know what I mean. There's always one loud and brassy one in every family. <laughs> <laughs> That's me. Sorry. So we meet at Rawdon Creme, Rawdon Creme Victoria. Uh, <clears throat> and it's my grandparents, both sets of them. Um, Live next to the crowd in Red Brick Semis, and that's how my mum and dad met in 1939, just before he joined up as a regular. She met him three weeks before he went off to the Air Force. <laughs> so I used to play in the grounds where this crematorium is because it wasn't a crematorium, it was Red Beck and allotments and stuff like that. And then in 1959, they put the crematorium in. So it's very short. Edith Sherman. The chimney is camouflaged with climbing ivy. Its effective dispatch of flesh fume monitored by a council committee. Burials are now the main concern. I played here before the monster came and stole Grandpa's allotment. The dry earth he loosened with his trowel is mixed with his ashes and nows, dads, and now mum. Melted wax is lifted to make wealth. My brother, Andrew, uh, sent me a text this morning, a year ago, from a year ago, almost exactly, he was very poor, he had uh, cancer of the bell. He lives in Kirby Longsdale, I shouldn't talk about Kirby, and that's where the enemy lives. And I shouldn't tell you, he's got a wine bar there. That's enough for the advertising. <laughs> <coughs> but he got taken to Lancaster Ho Hospital and it was pretty rough. Uh, the text, uh, I did send him a text saying, you're coming tonight. I think you'd bring the tribe along. And I said, John had a voice like Cat Steve. So I get this back saying, uh, can't come tonight, I'm working. Wine bar. Can't come tonight, I'm working. Can you tell me where the children play? Oh. So Cat Steve. <laughs> <laughs> it, it, that's the sort of, you know. That's oh, truth. Here we go. Brother Andrew. Text. Poorly post-op. In pain. They got it. Surgeon had a good look. Best not to visit. Edith. The fiercest of protectors and mum. Help your youngest boy before he comes home. There's a sleeping mouth-gaped hulk of man with a mostly covered bellied clipped seam. It's partly open white of eye turns brown. Practiced through years of long work and grabbed sleep. With his wife's help, there's a wash and change. He's then allowed a cup of tea's first sip. I suspect the taste of tea's a bit strange. An uncomfortable hiccup. The plastic lines of sodium lactate drip. There's a line of get well cards, crowd above, but there's an overwhelming wanting to be sick. Slowly sitting up, he gives his love. He's now very visibly thinner. His deeply tired eyes seem much bigger, but his arms found freedom from the drip. His handshakes are gentle. His wounds now dressed, having the 
suddenly burst whilst caught short and forced to shout for a nurse. Seemingly for years, his stomach felt off. Sometimes workaholics are mortally blind. This is his holiday period. The following he said it was the worst kind. This is the, the part of the evening where I get to play some love songs just to show that I can. Because <laughs> it is just occasionally. It's called All the King's Horses. <laughs> told to put up your hand if you believe in God and all the kids but one held up a hand the teacher asked the boy who didn't put up his hand why and then the teacher said it's a black mark on your soul then the boy who didn't put up his hand in belief of God told his mother but the teacher had said, there's a black mark on your soul. As the boy grew to a man, he behaved as if condemned. His best friend asked why. 
And the boy turned man and said that a teacher had said, there's a black mark on the soul. When his mother died, she left a letter to the boy, now man, in it she said, I spoke to the school that day, the teacher said, there's a black mark on your soul. The school said, the teacher asked, all those who believed in God to put up their hand. You didn't put up your hand, and the teacher asked you why. And you showed the teacher your shoe, which smelled. And the teacher said, there's a black mark on your soul. <laughs> That was based on something told me by a colleague at work. The place I used to work for eight weeks ago. I won't name him. <laughs> I've told him about it. About me. I called this one originally Beckham's Foot, but uh, it was based on him being paid £20,000 a day and it's the average annual pay. And, and that was only two years ago. And it, it's crazy, so I've now called it Rooney's Foot. <laughs> uh, and I made £50,000 and I crossed that line because I have a gang of pay because it's just way crazy money is this stuff Rooney's foot being paid 50000 a day for kicking a bloated pig's bladder around a field the world's gone much madder who pay those who go to premiership games played in the field of dreams by worshipped names like loud 12 year olds in a local park with names on 40 pound shirts the choice is stark we can't afford to go i don't know when 30 pounds to watch rubbish when it should be free you've got your foot so you've only got 10. i can't i'm too old I've knackered my knees. There's more. <laughs>
Please close that door quietly. Sergeant in Bradford Police, joined the Navy in the war age 15, right about his age. And uh, Tom's claim to fame was that as a radio operator intercepted a message which saved his ship uh, from being uh, sunk, saved 300 lives. Put it in a complex way, it was my daughter's grandfather, or he was my ex father. So this is the an absolute joke based on something he told me. Just for those of you who don't know, just remember the name Rob Wilton, an old time comedian who used to go to the day broadcast. Oh, it's just phenomenal. Bradford Magistrates trusted Sergeant Tom with his notable notebook. He'd never failed to give evidence to always jail. The man denied cruelty. I've done nothing wrong. Then Sergeant Tom said, I'll just read me notes from the page. There's a one-eyed cat to the west of North Parade. A jewel thief claimed they'd got the wrong man. 
and that he found the earring in the road. The magistrate wondered why there was only one and thought there's a tale here to be told. Then Sergeant Tom said, I'll just read my notes from the page. There's a woman with one ear <laughs> to the west of North Parade. And so it went on from the notebook of Sergeant Tom. His notable notebooks face spread far and wide. Then one dark night, it seemed the book had gone. At first, some thought Sergeant Tom had lied. As back in court, the evidence carried on. A violent man denied he'd been bitten by a pensioner in self-defence. His arm had been caught by his kitten, which disliked his dog and had taken offence. The magistrate thought, this case is not shut. Sergeant Tom, can you tell how the mark on the arm was put? Then Sergeant Tom said, I'll just read me notes from the page. There's a set of false teeth we found to the west of North Parade. A previously respectable man denied accepting an offer of trade. His defence was simple to understand. He had eaten and therefore not paid. The complainant, not wearing shoes, appeared in court. Fresh from the fish shop and worse for wear, she denied all knowledge of having been caught ramming her shoe's heel into this man's hair. In sight Tom said, I'll just read my notes from the page. There's a red shoe with a broken heel in a bin to the west of North Parade. The magistrate couldn't see the notebook that seemed to rest in Sergeant Tom's hands and so went forward to have a look. But before the magistrate's eyes had scanned, Sergeant Tom explained, invisibility, the painting art of which I can't reveal, advanced camouflage for security to protect this book that some would like to steal. It was invented the day war broke out and it's sometimes used to cover up Doubt. The magistrate convinced said, carry on. And on and on he went, did Sergeant Tom. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Two short ones. This was based in Italy. It's sort of semi serious. There's a battle going on in Italy, and it'll go on for another century more. It's gone on for centuries already about eight centuries actually it's it's Florence versus Ravenna it ain't football we're trying to get Dante's body back <laughs> Florence kicked him out in, was it 1250 kind of a bit later than that he snuffed it in 1320 or something like that so they're trying to get the body back because it's dust no bones there they, they actually cracked into the sepulchre in the 17th century and it was just dust there's no bones <laughs> dust now we hear the verdict of the coroner. His bones stay here for the fifth time of saying. He sleeps in peace with us, the Ravanese. The sculptor's scoop from the tomb is trafficking of carpet dust, which fills an envoy's envy. How sad that place should feel perpetual pain. Carpet dust, according to the notary. So here we are, in front of Ravenna's day, entry, we see Dante at his writing desk. Above the gloom, a lamp, dully floods the stain of exiled death. <laughs> this one is the reason we call ourselves Hubbubbub. It's, it's this poetic technique which Trish taught me the minions so that I can barely spell it on a matter of paper. You try saying it. You know, you use, use words which sound like, you know, so clap. <coughs> Sorry. <coughs> clap. Can't even get the sound right to fit the word. So, hubbub. Definition from the OED. Confused din, disturbance or riot. <laughs> it's a graphic poem. 
A car drove past as if to meet the dead. Its front near side tire like unleavened bread. Hubba bub, hubba bub bub, hubba bub. All cobbles set smooth but not fastened down, ready to be picked in a riotous town. Hubba bub, hubba bub bub, hubba bub. Some police parked up to go for a feed. The car saw the police and increased its speed. Hubba bub, hubba bub, hubba bub, hubba bub. The car turned first left and slowed to a halt. Hubba bub. <coughs> hubba bub. Bub. Hubba bub. Can we help, sir? Do you know you've got a flat tyre? Hubba bub. <laughs> <laughs> I got out the slime yesterday, late afternoon. Wasn't long before he came over here looking for you. Yeah, I saw him face to face. I met a warm embrace. I told him I'd been sleeping with you. Mm -hmm. Why'd you go and leave the pretty girl alone at home? Got no choice. So what we have to do. So here we go. Uh, oh yes, here we go. This is a dangerous one. Start settled. <laughs> oh, I have a chance in my arm. I wrote this last week. Took a whole week. Taking stuff out. <laughs> Can't say that. Here we go. I've got to tell you though, any resemblance to the reality of settle <laughs> is utterly coincidental <laughs> and unintended. <laughs> get the doors open. I need to get away quick. <laughs> What's Settle like? It's a small town that seems to be big. But the money in the mains, on the mains, in gig. There's long settled names Lambert, Eccleston, Lord, a lord owned Burnley. Was he from here? Settles full of Burnley supporters with dreams of Pointer and Adamson, heroes of yesteryear. Like childhood memories, those claret glory days are long since gone. 
Some practices give rise to concern. The deadly nature of a pub serious dom. An honesty box in a shop, not like Bolton. He took Boxing Day off from the shop, did Tom. A famous tray, back from a Brighton book, greeted by candles that caused a second look. A cafe that's never seen a naked man, but profits from the possibility. The calculated price of property, bought at auction and carved into three. Sold as holiday homes or buy to let. It's not that easy to buy, to get. Large tracts of town were once owned by women. There isn't an answer to a why not now. The old tithes revealed land, private and common. But there's a name that escapes me somehow. There's rumours. The lion will lose its gold. The yearly fun fair must move from the square. A planning application's been put on hold. An Archimedes screw never needs repair. Try parking. Now that's not gingerbread. For locals in some parts of the town, it's a get there first merry-go-round. A town book for horse and coach can't be spared. At North Rib Rugby, a noise begins to boom, boom. It's elephants, rhinos, and a great cave bear versus Romans and Raven Scots in the gloom. Down from the caves and cats of their Atomire lair. This small world will change when Daz cuts his nails. His memory of a lady's wartime escorts from the Falcon is one that never fails. RAF tights taken home from the dance to a cottage next door to his aunt's in the dinner of the dancing bear. It was long since dead, so don't go there. The last officer left lost more than his pants. What sometimes goes on is a local scrape. It's like recessive genes that can't escape. It used to be the distance, but others come here, like the Highland cows who show no faith when it's your right of way and they're in the road. They only live for two and a half years, so you might as well wait. <laughs> and do as you're told by Mother Nature. But there aren't enough to lose. <laughs> and that brings tears if you're a visitor. If you want to pray for relief, there's six churches. Pray to St Jude, the best for lost causes. Over the bridge and gig, the St Alcalde. The farms are hard pressed and fields full of sheep. You might be asked, which one do you want? It's more than enough to put you off meat, but it's only the word that's blunt. Gas lads, dash, grab Mr Lambert, mask, Major Lambert, chemist and inventor, was a settled man. As was Benjamin Waugh, who took the world to task for children. Settlers also got famous acquaintances, the captain of a starship who likes walking, Pontius Pilate who shouts from the shambles, the son of a man with curly hair called Hardy. Here's a point you take away and ponder. What's the town's characteristic feature? A place where questions take years to answer, like local or visitor. Hall or theatre. It's the place where every whisper's turned loud. It's where to a walker a pint stands proud. It's Friday's five o'clock cricket club beer. It's fresh ribble fish, but not poached here. It's where royals apostrophe and books second down. It's where Billy Braid and Atomire Bullet, where the builder builds too high and blames the plans. It's Castleberry Crag, Flag and Pub Circuit. It's Georgie's Porch playing guitar. It's Dr. Book here with his orchestra and son-in-law who died in the war. And of course his friend, 
Mr. Elder. It's the quick and the dead. Layer upon layer. It's desire for peace with peaceful prayer. It's a town that's full of character. And people who say, do you not? And not, don't you? <laughs> The great thing about writing your own songs is nobody ever knows when you go wrong. I've just realised I've forgotten the entire verse from the last one. Great. Never mind, I won't play it again. I always say this, why don't we Quakers here? And I always get that answer. <laughs> Never. <laughs> Society of Friends. I wrote this song about a Quaker in Hebden Bridge who'd gone to Palestine. This actually dragged them in. <laughs> it was an acknowledgement of their courage. It's called Blessed Be the Peacemakers. Thursday night dance in the Second World War that used to misbehave. On New Year's Day this year, I got a shot. It's the time of Epiphany, you know, the legend, three wise men coming from afar to see the baby Jesus. A real Epiphany through Bosnia, Iraq, and Afghanistan. 
comes this unknown baby boy now emailed man revealed to that certainty that was sought for name and sex as neither that was thought in that curious silence I said to Kate I've got a 37 year old brother <laughs> and that's him <laughs> Mackie Marcus Sergeant Major Marcus Arthur known as Mackie Football daft. I told him if I brought him up, he'd have been a lead supporter. He said, no way. He's Coventry City and daft. Grew up in a good home then. And he's about, <laughs> he's about to go operation in two weeks' time, again. What we're going to do now is move towards the act of remembrance. And what I would ask you to do, i just say something ever so slightly here. John is going to do a song which we feel fits the, the mood. When he's finished um, with his song, would you all stand in silence, if you can stand? And I will ring Binion's for the fall. We will have silence following, and then I will close the act of remembrance with Edmund's Kohima epitaph which you will immediately recognise. John. Thank you, Steve. said goodbye and I don't know why you were gone so fast could hardly blink my eye dark is a lonely road away from home why did you have to go so fast so soon I never knew what pain was until you went away I never knew what pain was until you went away Why does it have to be away from me? Just waiting for my life to pass on by. For I cannot understand who strike this hand against the beautiful you and all around I never knew what pain was until you went away I never knew what pain was until you went away Why does it have to be? Come home to me Waiting for life to pass me by For life is its longest day So long to stay Will you wait for me like I will wait for you? Thank you. They shall not grow old 
as we that are left grow old. Age shall not weary them, nor the years condemn, at the going down of the sun and in the morning. We will remember them. We will remember them. When you go home, tell them of us and say, for your tomorrow, we give our today. Just as we finish to say a big thank you to the friends of Victoria Theatre who put yourselves out as volunteers, unpaid, week in, week out. And what it's like to do that sort of work. I'm still doing it even though I've now retired, but in Bradford. So a big thank you to yourselves. And I can also say thank you to you for coming and hope that you appreciated what we did tonight. Thank you. <laughs> Say, so, quickly. This, this, the money in here is not for us. This is going to help. It's going to help for Heroes, which is a charity specifically focused on Henry Court uh, and to people severely wounded uh, in action. We've seen quite a bit on the news. It's not the British Legion. Um, we would normally be doing something for the British Legion at this time of year, but because of the events in my life, um, they put a focus on the charity that my son actually works for. Thank you very much for this. Thank you. Thank you.